8.4.4. Are there any Marxist thinkers close to anarchism? None of the libertarian socialists we highlighted in the last section were Marxists. This is unsurprising as most forms of Marxism are authoritarian. However, this is not the case for all schools of Marxism. There are important sub-branches of Marxism which shares the anarchist vision of a self-managed society. These include council communism, situationism, and autonomism. Perhaps significantly, these few Marxist tendencies which are closest to anarchism are, like the branches of anarchism itself, not named after individuals. We will discuss each in turn. Council Communism was born in the German Revolution of 1919, when Marxists inspired by the example of the Russian Soviets and disgusted by the centralism, opportunism, and betrayal of the mainstream Marxist Social Democrats, drew similar anti-parliamentarian, direct actionist, and decentralized conclusions to those held by anarchists since Bakunin. Like Marx's libertarian opponent in the First International, they argued that a federation of workers' councils would form the basis of a socialist society and, consequently, saw the need to build militant workplace organizations to promote their formation. Lenin attacked these movements and their advocates in his diatribe Left-Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder, which council communist Hermann Gorder demolished in his An Open Letter to Comrade Lenin. By 1921, the Council Communists broke with the Bolshevism that had already effectively expelled them from both the National Communist Parties and the Communist International. Like the anarchists, they argued that Russia was a state capitalist party dictatorship and had nothing to do with socialism. And again, like anarchists, the Council Communists argued that the process of building a new society, like the revolution itself, is either the work of the people themselves or doomed from the start. As with the anarchists, they too saw the Bolshevik takeover of the Soviets, like that of the trade unions, as subverting the revolution and beginning the restoration of oppression and exploitation. To discover more about Council Communism, the works of Paul Maddock are essential reading. While best known as a writer on Marxist economic theory in such works as Marx and Keynes, Economic Crisis and Crisis Theory, and Economics, Politics and the Age of Inflation, Maddock had been a council communist since the German Revolution of 1919-1920. His books Anti-Bolshevik Communism and Marxism, The Last Refuge of the Bourgeoisie, are excellent introductions to his political ideas. Also essential reading is Anton Panikok's works. His classic workers' councils explains council communism from first principles, while his Lenin as philosopher dissects Lenin's claims to being a Marxist. Serge Brissener's Panikek and the Workers' Councils is the best study of the development of Panikek's idea. In the UK, the militant suffragette Sylvia Pankhurst became a council communist under the impact of the Russian Revolution and, along with anarchists like Guy Aldred, led the opposition to the importation of Leninism into the communist movement there. See Mark Shipway's Anti-Parliamentary Communism, the Movement for Workers' Councils in Britain 1917-45 for more details of libertarian communism in the UK. Building upon the ideas of council communism, the situationists developed their ideas in important new directions. Working in the late 1950s and 1960s, they combined council communist ideas with surrealism and other forms of radical art to produce an impressive critique of post-war capitalism. Unlike Castoriadis, Unlike Castoriadis, whose ideas influenced them, the situationists continued to view themselves as Marxists, developing Marx's critique of capitalist economy into a critique of capitalist society as alienation had shifted from being located in capitalist production into everyday life. They coined the expression, the spectacle, to describe a social system in which people become alienated from their own lives and played the role of an audience, of spectators. Thus, capitalism had turned being into having, and now, with the spectacle, it turned having into appearing. They argued that we could not wait for a distant revolution, but rather should liberate ourselves in the here and now, creating events, situations, which would disrupt the ordinary and normal to jolt people out of their allotted roles within society. A social revolution based on sovereign rank-and-file assemblies and self-managed councils would be the ultimate situation and the aim of all situationists. 
While critical of anarchism, the differences between the two theories are relatively minor and the impact of the situationists on anarchism cannot be underestimated. Many anarchists embraced their critique of modern capitalist society, their subversion of modern art and culture for revolutionary purposes, and call for revolutionizing everyday life. Ironically, while situationism viewed itself as an attempt to transcend tradition forms of Marxism and anarchism, it essentially became subsumed by anarchism. The classic works of situationism are Guy Debord's Society of the Spectacle and Raoul Venegaim's The Revolution of Everyday Life. The Situationist International Anthology, edited by Ken Nabbs, is essential reading for any budding situationists, as is Nabbs' own public secrets. Lastly, there is autonomous Marxism. Drawing on the works of the Council Communism, Castoriadis, Situationism, and others, it places the class struggle at the heart of its analysis of capitalism. It initially developed in Italy during the 1960s and had many currents, some closer to anarchism than others. While the most famous thinker in the autonomous tradition is probably Antonio Negri, who coined the wonderful phrase, money has only one face, that of the boss in Marx Beyond Marx, his ideas are more within traditional Marxist. For an autonomist whose ideas are closer to anarchism, we need to turn to the US thinker and activist who has written one of the best summaries of Kropotkin's ideas in which he usefully indicates the similarities between anarcho-communism and autonomous Marxism. Kropotkin, Self-Valorization and the Crisis of Marxism. His book, Reading Capital Politically, is an essential text for understanding autonomism and its history. For Cleaver, autonomist Marxism is a generic name for a variety of movements, politics, and thinkers who have emphasized the autonomous power of workers, autonomous from capital, obviously, but also from their official organizations. For example, the trade unions, the political parties, and, moreover, the power of particular groups of working-class people to act autonomously from other groups, for example, women from men. By autonomy, it is meant the ability of working-class people to define their own interests and to struggle for them and, critically, to go beyond mere reaction to exploitation and to take the offensive in ways that shape the class struggle and define the future. Thus, they place working-class people at the center of their thinking about capitalism, how it develops and its dynamics, as well as in the class conflicts within it. This is not limited to just the workplace and just as workers resist the imposition of work inside the factory or office via slowdowns, strikes, and sabotage, so too do the non-waged resist the reduction of their lives to work. For autonomists, the creation of communism is not something that comes later, but is something which is repeatedly created by current developments of new forms of working class self-activity. The similarities with social anarchism are obvious which probably explains why autonomists spend so much time analyzing and quoting Marx to justify their ideas, for otherwise, other Marxists will follow Lenin's lead on the council communists and label them anarchists and ignore them. For anarchists, all this Marx quoting seems amusing. Ultimately, if Marx really was an autonomist Marxist, then why do autonomists have to spend so much time reconstructing what Marx really meant? Why did he not just say it clearly to begin with? Similarly, why root out sometimes obscure quotes and sometimes passing comments from Marx to justify your insights? Does something stop being true if Marx did not mention it first? Whatever the insights of autonomism, its Marxism will drag it backwards by rooting its politics in the texts of two long-dead Germans. Like the surreal debate between Trotsky and Stalin in the 1920s over socialism in one country conducted by means of Lenin quotes, all that will be proved is not whether a given idea is right, but simply that the mutually agreed authority figure, Lenin or Marx, may have held it. Thus anarchists suggest that autonomists practice some autonomy when it comes to Marx and Engels. Other libertarian Marxists close to anarchism include Eric Fromm and Wilhelm Reich. Both tried to combine Marx with Freud to produce a radical analysis of capitalism and the personality disorders it causes. Eric Fromm, in such books as The Fear of Freedom, Man for Himself, The Sane Society, and To Have or To Be, developed a powerful and insightful analysis of capitalism which discussed how it shaped the individual and built psychological barriers to freedom and authentic living. 
His works discuss many important topics, including ethics, the authoritarian personality, what causes it and how to change it, alienation, freedom, individualism, and what a good society would be like. Fromm's analysis of capitalism and the having mode of life are incredibly insightful, especially in context with today's consumerism. For Fromm, the way we live, work, and organize together influence how we develop, our health, mental, and physical, our happiness more than we suspect. He questions the sanity of a society which covets property over humanity and adheres to theories of submission and domination rather than self-determination and self-actualization. His scathing indictment of modern capitalism shows that it is the main source of the isolation and alienation prevalent in today's society. Alienation for Fromm is at the heart of the system, whether private or state capitalism. We are happy to the extent that we realize ourselves, and for this to occur, our society must value the human over the inanimate property. Fromm rooted his ideas in a humanistic interpretation of Marx, rejecting Leninism and Stalinism as an authoritarian corruption of his ideas. Open quote. The destruction of socialism began with Lenin. End quote. Moreover, he stressed the need for a decentralized and libertarian form of socialism, arguing that the anarchists had been right to question Marx's preferences for states and centralization. As he put it, the open quote, Errors of Marx and Engels and their centralistic orientation were due to the fact that they were much more rooted in the middle class tradition of the 18th and 19th centuries, both psychologically and intellectually, than men like Fourier, Owen, Proudhon, and Kropotkin. As the contradiction in Marx between the principles of centralization and decentralization, for Fromm, Marx and Engels were much more bourgeois thinkers than were men like Proudhon, Bakunin, Kropotkin, and Landauer. Paradoxical as it sounds, the Leninist development of socialism represented a regression to the bourgeois concepts of the state and of political power, rather than the new socialist concept as it was expressed so much clearer by Owen, Proudhon, and others." End quote. Fromm's Marxism, therefore, was fundamentally of a libertarian and humanist type, and his insights of profound importance for anyone interested in changing society for the better. Wilhelm Reich, like Fromm, set out to elaborate a social psychology based on both Marxism and psychoanalysis. For Reich, sexual repression led to people amenable to authoritarianism and happy to subject themselves to authoritarian regimes. While he famously analyzed Nazism in this way, in the mass psychology of fascism, his insights also apply to other societies and movements, it is no coincidence, for example, that the religious right in America oppose premarital sex and use scare tactics to get teenagers to associate it with disease, dirt, and guilt. His argument is that due to sexual repression, we develop what he called character armor, which internalizes our oppressions and ensures that we can function in a hierarchical society. This social conditioning is produced by the patriarchal family, and its net results is a powerful reinforcement and perpetuation of the dominant ideology and the mass production of individuals with obedience built into them, individuals ready to accept the authority of teacher, priest, employer, and politician, as well as to endorse the prevailing social structure. This explains how individuals and groups can support movements and institutions which exploit or oppress them. In other words, they think, feel, and act against themselves and, moreover, can internalize their own oppression to such a degree that they may even seek to defend their subordinate position. Thus, for Reich, sexual repression produces an individual who is adjusted to the authoritarian order and who will submit to it in spite of all misery and degradation it causes them. The net result is sphere of freedom and a conservative, reactionary mentality. Sexual repression aids political power, not only through the process which makes the mass individual passive and unpolitical, but also by creating in their character structure an interest in actively supporting the authoritarian order. While his unidimensional focus on sex is misplaced, his analysis of how we internalize our oppression in order to survive under hierarchy is important for understanding why so many of the most oppressed people seem to love their social position and those who rule over them. 
By understanding this collective character structure and how it forms, also provides humanity with new means of transcending such obstacles to social change. Only an awareness of how people's character structure prevents them from becoming aware of their real interests can it be combated and social self-emancipation assured. Maurice Breton's The Irrational in Politics is an excellent short introduction to Reich's ideas which links their insights to libertarian socialism.